Bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Visit them on the web at recursivesquirrel.com. Episode 617, Chicken Scented Lube. December 14th, 2020. It's time for this week's edition of the Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. AT&T has rocked the entertainment industry with its plans to stream all 2021 Warner Brothers releases on HBO Max on the same day as the theatrical release. Is it an inspired strategy or a disastrous misstep? Tonight, we'll discuss. Also, a bullish look at the future of social media, the rumored Apple search engine, Amazon becomes the world's largest advertiser, Plus, this week's Fair, Fail, Foul. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with the Chief Marketing Officer for AutoZen, one of the world's greatest word-of-mouth marketers, Mr. Saul Colt. Hi, Saul. Hey, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, also joining him, we have the Chief Marketing and Innovation Officer for California-based ad agency RPA, Mr. Tim Leake. Hi, Tim. Hey, Bob. Great to be back. I think this is my first Beancast of 2020, so I, no. I hope that means it's the start of turning everything around. It cannot possibly be the first Beancast for you in 2020. I had to have had you I on one so. time before. 2020 was a pretty bad year. So Yeah, everything got shuffled to the side. <laughs> There was a whole month I didn't even do shows, so it's been a very, very strange, strange year. But we'll get into that next week when we do the year-end wrap-up. Right now, we got some big stuff to talk about. Uh, First on my topic list for this week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, AT&T-owned Time Warner announced that Wonder Woman 1984 would release simultaneously in theater and via HBO Max, their new streaming service. Then last week, uh, the company doubled down on the tactic, announcing all of the Time Warner 2021 releases would follow suit, causing quite a bit of consternation in the entertainment industry. The big question, Tim, is, is it marketing brilliance or corporate suicide? I mean, in one sense, I I like this. It's very consumer friendly. It's, It's definitely something that makes HBO Max much more exciting, much more valuable to the average consumer. But at the same time, won't this put theaters out of business? Isn't this going to somehow hit a roadblock when stars can't get the same salaries that they were getting for box office receipts and share of revenue? I mean, what's going on here? Yeah, I I, I love this question because it's so meaty and there's so much to unpack here. Uh, So I think to answer the question, I think it's both, you know, brilliant and corporate suicide. And uh, (laughs) it can't possibly be both, could it? (laughs) Well, I will explain. Um, So I I subscribe to HBO Max. I think it's great. I like I I really I watch it all the time. Uh, I like it. It costs more than Netflix or Disney Plus, but it costs the same as plain old HBO always has. and, And it has way more to it. So and yet I read that, uh, you know, if they've got 12.6 million subscribers where Netflix has 195 million and Disney Plus has 87 million and and only 30 percent of current HBO subscribers have signed up and they get it free like they're already paying for that. So clearly they needed a big play. And and I think this will do the trick. I, I think if I hadn't subscribed, I certainly would now. Uh, it's it's a huge big deal. Um, but. I'm also a huge movie fan. I love seeing them in theaters and not being able to do so this year has sucked. In addition to not being on the Beancast up till now, it sucked not being able to see movies <laughs> in theaters. And and I can't wait to go back. But, but uh-huh. you know, as an audience member, as a person, when they made that announcement that these 17 big releases are all coming to HBO Max, I thought that's cool. And and I bet lots of other people thought that too. But, but cool is not the word that, that 
people in the industry have used. But to put it lightly, I think most of them hated it. And it seems like it's going to have a very major impact on Warner's relationships with their talent. So, you know, I think there's a lot of smart stuff that they did. But, uh, you know, and, and I like the fact, you know, somebody with the word innovation in their title, I, I, I believe this, you know, uh, Jason Kylar, who's their CEO, said, he had this quote in a New York Times article that I read earlier, uh, and I'd write this one down, is that there's no situation where everyone is going to stand up and applaud. That's not the way innovation plays out. This is not easy, nor is it intended to be easy, because when you're trying something new, you have to expect and be ready for some people who are not comfortable with change, and that's okay. And I agree with that. It's like, so to a degree, everybody moaning and whining is it kind of reminds me of, of Metallica complaining about Napster back in the day. Um, the change is going to happen. But at the same time, it sounds like they didn't tell anybody that, that they work with, all their partners, that they were planning to do this. And the partners are not happy. They feel blindsided. They don't believe in it. They feel like it, it's, it's going to damage theaters. And, and we don't know whether it will damage theaters. I think actually that's part of the brilliant bit is that we'll find out next year. <laughs> it's a bit of, a, you know, when we can really, really go to the theater or watch it at home, that's going to be a fascinating test. And, and the, he's hedged his bet, this guy, Jason. Uh, he, he's hedged his bet in terms of saying it's only going to be for next year. So they got an easy out. They aren't committed to it forever. But they clearly are committed further than those optimists among us think that we're going to have to stay quarantined. Well, that, so, that's the whole thing. The caveats, I, the caveats involved are what keep it reasonable. I mean, it's, you know, it's only going to be the films are only going to be released for a month. You know, they're not going to be in perpetuity. Um, you know, it's, it's in the still going to be dead in the center of COVID time. People are not going to be going to movie theaters. Even if there is a vaccine, we're not going to get it until the summer. Most of us. So, right. I mean, you know, it makes sense. I'm sorry to talk on top of you. Saul, what were you going to say? So I'm going to take a different approach. I, I too think that it's it's um, it's genius and suicidal, uh, but it's not suicidal for Warner so much as it's suicidal for the the theater industry. Um, you know, the only person that Warner and AT and T are actually accountable for, unfortunately, the reality is their shareholders. So they've already invested their billion dollars or whatever collectively went into these 21 titles could even be more than a billion dollars. Um, and they're sitting on inventory that they can't sell, but you know, they're actually not partners with the movie theaters. The movie theaters are distribution and they're they're They also own their own distribution. So they're sitting on this stuff. They're looking to not, um, you know, die themselves. So they've, you know, they basically said, we're going to release them, but you know, they're going to they're going to make, you know, a, a tenth of what they would have made in a normal year on these movies. But at least they'll make a tenth. I'm pretty sure their goal for 2020 uh, or 2021 is just to break even uh, on some of these films because they're so a uh, thing. If you look at the film industry, it's really just become there's two types of films. There's superhero movies and there's uh, independent films and independent films could survive quite well on on the streaming services and stuff like that but you know like we read that am well i read that amc uh movie theaters were counting on the james bond movie just to stay afloat and i, I haven't really followed the story i don't know if they did file for bankruptcy uh, the rumor was they were filing for bankruptcy because this movie didn't come out um you know Everybody is just kind of, you know, trying to get through this and survive. I'm going to go as far to, to say that, you know, it's brilliant what they're doing because going to a movie theater is not the best way to watch a movie right now. Um, and I, and that's not even COVID related. No, when you it's think not. of having to stick to a schedule, when you think of having to overpay for popcorn and all that garbage, I got a big ass TV with an amazing set of headphones. You know, I don't have the nine speaker setup and the, the Atmos Dolby and everything, but my headphones like pretty much replicate the experience, the sound experience of going to a movie theater and I could be in my bathtub, I could be on my bed, I could be naked, I could be any way I want to actually like take in this movie at any time. So, you know, we talk about Uber, you know, at the early days of Uber, oh, it was so unfair to taxi. And we talk about the early days of Airbnb, oh, it was so unfair to hotels, you know. Every industry has to kind of evolve and figure things out. And I don't think, you know, movie theaters are going to go away forever. But I could tell you there's no 
bigger fan of movies than me. I literally watch five nights a week. I watch movies while I sit on my exercise bike and I will only, only, only ever go to a movie theater taking COVID out of the, the conversation. If it's like, you know, if I'm going to see a, an Avengers movie and sit in the seats that, that shake and, and juke and go uh, <laughs> and because any other movie to me, I, I feel the experience is better at home. And, and, you know, and, 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 you know, just sort of to tag on something else I said, all our habits have changed over this last 10 months. And every report I've read says people predict that these habits will carry forward. So just because movie theaters open and maybe there's a vaccine and everyone feels better, people are just so used to not going to movie theaters right now. It is going to be very, very difficult to just you know, for that light switch to switch on and everything to be okay. So um, if we strip away the emotion of it and there's nobody more emotional about entertainment than me, this is just them trying to get rid of some dead inventory and break even. And, you know, and, and they're going to make some money because HBO Max is only available in North America or only available in, in the United States. Yeah. I, in Canada, um, it will be available on Christmas Day, Wonder Woman. It's going to be $30 to watch it in my mm. home. And guess what? I'll probably watch it because I'm kind of starved for, you know, like I'm tired of watching, you know, I've, I've been watching um, Alias from season one and I, I'm tired <laughs> of watching things. I, I want I want something pretty impactful. So I'm willing to pay probably what it would have cost to go to the movie theater, except the money's going all to the, uh, all to the film company. Maybe a little bit is cut off for the, the carrier, but it's not going to be that 50, 50 ticket split. So if they can actually make this work, um, you know, it, it kind of means we'll still get blockbusters because without movies, without, you know, this new model working, I can't see anybody investing $200 million to make a film. We're only going to get those 30, $35 million movies, which are great. I love those too, but man, it's, it's really fun four times a year to see something really spectacular i gotta yeah, admit guy, i gotta i gotta admit i'm okay. listening to both of you talk and i'll let you go in a second tim but i'm not seeing a downside i mean nothing you're saying sounds like a downside to me you've got a, a theater industry that's already uh depressed from covid they're not going to be getting people into you're not going to getting butts and seats for any movies this coming year it's not going to work for them um, the, you know, Time Warner is sitting on a gold mine of content that people want to see and is giving them an opportunity to see it. It's driving subscriptions to their fledgling network and it's going to make revenue for them internationally, you know, either theatrically or via the $30 download download. So, I mean, I can think of one down, I can think of a big downside and, and it's what's been in the, in the news constantly, which, which is all the talent and you know, whether, whether it's the directors or the movie stars or the agents or everybody that they rely on to be able to make these great films are upset. And whether they'll be upset long term, like I, like I said earlier, it's, it, it reminds me kind of of the Metallica thing where, where people who are benefiting off of the let me let me, uh, let me stop you right there and let me ask you a question. Are they really upset? I mean, you know, everybody gets upset <laughs> because somebody at the, uh, at the somebody influential among that group gets upset and everybody follows suit and gets upset without really thinking about it and thinking through the problem. And as they end up getting the same amount of money and the same amount of uh, adulation and the same amount of viewership and the same amount of buzz for their film – don't you think all that uh, animosity is just going to go away for the talent? It, it might. A and that's where it'll, you know, it'll have to shake out. So far, anybody who's bet big on streaming has done well. And I, I think that's the long play here. It isn't just to get rid of the inventory that they've got. It's their streaming platform is underperforming. And this is a chance to bring it up to the to to, the, to where it really should be, you know, HBO is always a, a premium competitor against a Netflix, so it's weird to me that it's not doing better than it is. So this this is a chance to get people in because I think they're going to come in for these big tentpole movies, but then they're going to see what else is there. They either are confused because they named it stupid, um, but or or they're they're they literally just don't know what's there or, or whatever it is. They're 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 they think the price is too high. I'm not sure what is causing people to not sign up specifically, but I think that's that's the big long term play in terms of whether these other people are really I think they really are upset because they wouldn't be the, the people who make the films for Warner Brothers speaking out 
and and saying this is a horrible idea. It's pr- I don't think it's the press coverage that they were hoping for when they got this. I'm sure they would have wanted to spin it positive uh, as opposed to. Uh, yeah, I got to believe that they knew dicey. that they were. I got to believe that they so, knew they so were in for well, trouble. Well, let's, you know? let's call out Christopher Nolan for a minute, who really kind of started it. At least he's the one that that got the most media attention. He he had a movie, Tenant, that I, I didn't see, so I don't know if it's good or bad. My comment, my comment has nothing to do about the quality of the movie, but it made zero money because he they released it in theaters exactly when kind of we were at you know the that first height of of the mm-hmm. whole stay at home movement um he claims that his movie was designed to be in a theater you won't get the same reaction at home i, I think that's a little bit of um auteurism if that's a even a word <laughs> I'm, I'm making it up but you know someone who i i admire and love and respect a great deal i don't know him so this is just from a fan's perspective is david lynch and david lynch famously like six years ago, seven years ago, said that he hopes that nobody ever watches his um, his content on a streaming system. And three weeks ago, he just signed a deal to make like a 15 episode, uh, you know, show on Netflix. So I think everybody's sort of, you know, like you either grow, you learn, you change, you adapt with the time. Maybe Christopher Nolan is a, is, is a little upset that just timing really wasn't on his side with this movie. And, and he designed something so specific for, you know, a, a one distribution, but everybody knows most of the money is after the movie leaves the theater anyway. So shame on him. If he designed something for only one specific kind of use case, because that shows like a tunnel vision that, that would, you know, have the reaction that he's giving right now. I do think there's, there is something to the back end uh, payments that was tied to box office performance. And I'm not an expert on it, but from what I've read, they did not go back and renegotiate something new because they're not doing that. And so that is part of the core. And, 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 you know, this is, that's what happens, right? When innovation comes along and somebody does something new, it's, it's messy and it's bumpy and we eventually figure it out. And I think the, the fascinating thing about the year that is 2020 is how much it's just amplified all this stuff that would have taken at least five more years of, of bumpiness to figure out. We just did it because we had to. And that's exactly what's happening here as well. How is this any different from what Netflix and Prime do all the time? I mean, you know, Prime and Netflix both were railed against by the film industry for um, releasing their films in theaters for a week and then suddenly having them available to stream on their streaming services and, you know, going up for Academy Awards because they had a theatrical release. I mean, you know, there was a bunch of belly aching about that, but now all the biggest cinematographers and all the biggest mm. directors, cinema directors are, are going to Netflix, going to Prime. So, they're, they're bringing their, their properties to them. So why, why is this any different? So I'm going to take a guess at this. So, you know, send your, your emails to Bob if I'm not correct here. But um, if I had to guess, I'd say that they probably have streaming deals for these movies set up already that maybe they would go to Netflix eventually or they'd go to these things by a certain date. So when when Disney Plus launched, they couldn't show all the Marvel movies because they had set up these streaming deals before the idea of Disney Plus uh, even existed. So Black Panther, I don't think, is actually, um, you know. Know, uh, exclusive to Disney Plus, or it wasn't until this year, or there was some sort of lag or something like this. They probably had exclusive deals with some of these other companies, and now they're they're essentially calling this the world release as opposed to the after world release that it would go somewhere else. So maybe people feel sort of cheated, but I, I actually think, like I said, like this is all kind of fair. They own the content. You know, it's you know the, the old the old expression content is is king but but distribution pays its mortgage they they own the distribution <laughs> platform why would they give it to anybody else and it will end up on netflix i'm sure because netflix will buy it and pay for it or maybe they won't maybe there'll be a, a very limited run on on hbo max to boost subscription and then they'll do the next one and the next one the next one but you know it's it's not like i don't think this is going to be exclusive to hbo max in perpetuity i think they're going to have it uh, uh, an early window and then they want it in as many places as possible and again this is only usa we're talking about i'm sure it's going to be you know everywhere around the world people are going to be watching um you know wonder woman 85 or 84 whatever it is uh, on that same day 
And, uh, you know, and, and again, it's only free, my understanding, on the 25th. On the 26th, you have to pay for it. It's like a value add, similar to what Disney Plus did with Mulan. Oh, no Mulan. way. I thought it was available for a month. I thought they were doing a one-month-long window. I thought so, Is too. It uh, so it, it's Thought actually, so. so what I read was it was free on both platforms. So maybe it's free in the theaters on the 25th, but I'm not sure if, uh, you know, any theaters will really be open, you know, based on the last few days of more and more, uh, more and more uh, areas going into lockdown. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a fascinating topic. It's one of those things that, you know, if we could solve it, we'd be billionaires right now. But unfortunately, we're not solving it. We're just talking about it. So let's move on to the next topic. Um, next up, I wanted to talk about Andreessen Horowitz's um, multiple blog posts that they put out this week. They, they put out a series of blog posts centered around the common theme of imagining the future of social. Now, a lot of it's pretty interesting the way they approach it, but putting aside the fact that most of the bullish attitude is focused on their own investments in the space, so there's a lot of vested interest in them writing something like this. So do they have a point with the idea that social connection built on common interest is the future of social media and actually has legs? Well, is, hasn't that been the promise of social since day one? Um, so you know, it's always social... been the, it's always been the promise. And you're, you're right; it's always yeah. been the promise. But it's, it's like it's one of those things that it's supposed to be part of a bigger social network, and then it's you know mm. comes down into these smaller little niches, and that niche social networks weren't viable. But they seem to be saying the exact opposite. So first of all, that was a rhetorical question. I know, but I'm going to answer it anyway. (laughs) Saying social is back is silly. Like it's never left, you know, just like with our previous conversation, it's changed. It's evolved several times. There's, you know, there's, you know, we've gone from, you know, whatever it was, 124 characters to, to, um, you know, seven second videos to, full feature videos to all sorts of things. And I agree social will come to the forefront again in a big way because more than ever, this is how we communicate with each other. You know, you know, especially when you look at responsible people who have been, you know, staying home for most of the year, our habits have changed, you know, and, and I said this with the movie going, our habits have changed and they're probably going to, you know, we're going to keep these, these habits, you know, we're, we're, we're all in on FaceTime now. We're all in on zoom or, or, you know, S- Skype or whatever, you know, whatever you're the, the one you choose. This is how we communicate now where we talk on the phone or we want to see somebody. We're using video chats. Social is the same way. And, you know, there, there was a, a report or somebody said that e-commerce has, has grown 10 years and 10 months. And, you know, I, I agree with that because, again, this is how we buy things now. But if e-commerce has, has um, grown 10 years and 10 months, social has had to keep up, you know. Word of mouth referrals are are not happening anymore at kids' soccer games and things like that. But companies still need to invest in them. And, you know, I I went through all the posts uh, that they wrote, all beautifully written, all very smart. um, But they were were really nothing more than advertorial and very self-serving. But the the halo message was correct. Um, So, you know, just sort of to rephrase my, my rambling, Social has changed and it's going to always keep changing if it's going to survive. Is it back? I would say it's never left. It's certainly different. And the companies who are investing in smaller communities, that's what we've been saying forever. It started out as community driven. It's We had community, people with titles of community managers. For whatever reason, that, that vanished and people didn't see the, the, the necessity and actually being social with their social media became just like a a, a push uh, platform instead of a push pull, and now all of a sudden people are like, oh man, people are home, engagement is way up. You know, the you know we're all on social all day long. We better figure this out properly, and that's where we're at, and that's where some companies are going to excel again. You know, when I was reading this, I read it something entirely different. I mean, my interpretation of it is that social is no longer a thing, that you don't go to a social network, that you're really looking at social as a feature, as part of a bigger community strategy. So, you know, the social interaction, the comments, the uh, arguments, the picture sharing, and all those social elements that we, you know, we associate with a bigger social network of lots of different features, um, all congregated in one place so that you can connect with your friends, 
seems to be in their future taking a back seat to um, this more this more niche focus of the content itself like if you're if you're into movies it's a movie site that has a robust social component as opposed to a movie site um being about movies only and being a one-way voice and social networks where the conversation happens uh, that that's what i interpreted am, am i wrong with that Saul? i mean it's just like it seems like that was what they were trying to get to which i find really fascinating if it's if it is or maybe i'm just thinking uh, outside the box here what do you think so so i read that and i sort of skipped over that that notion because uh you know that might have been what they meant i don't believe that's the solution i believe that you know it, brands are not going to create these hyper niche sites they're going to bring you know so so if you think of how social has changed we used to all live on facebook and then facebook changed their rules you couldn't con- you couldn't own your pages or all those sort of things so people nobody left facebook from a brand perspective but they opened up other channels and they opened up other areas so now i think you know when you look at the logos of the social networks on a on a corporate website of all the different ways you can contact people they're not driving you to one place you know i i don't see that and they're not driving you corporate owned places they want you to still have those collisions and they want you to still be able to share it on all the platforms so they're in more places maybe with the same message maybe without in Instead of driving everyone to say Facebook is our social media platform, Facebook is our thing. They're they're everywhere, and they're trying to talk to as many people as possible. They may have different content for each places. They may, um, you know, have different audiences. But you know, I, I can't see a single brand trying to one build their own TikTok or make TikTok their only place on the well, internet. But, but maybe not a brand. Maybe not a brand. I mean, but I, I can see around a subject matter them getting involved. Now, it, it's obviously not a billion dollar play like Facebook or multi-billion dollar play where you're aggregating huge audiences. But isn't that the point? I mean, there's such a problem with Facebook and Twitter with trolling and, you know, it's just like there, there's this constant push and pull of regulation and and thinking about it in this smaller, more manageable realm seems to be a, a better solution, maybe not a better monetary solution, which could doom it right from the start, but it, it seems like a better solution societally. Um, Tim, what do it's you? It's an th- interesting thing. Oh, go ahead, Bob. No, I was going to say, Tim, why don't you uh, weigh in here? Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, the uh, there there is a truth to that, and I think it's what's funny is the second social networks appeared on the scene, that's what every brand was thinking is that you know if we're Budweiser, what we had to do is put together a, a social network that that beer fans can congregate on, and and none of them worked. Which isn't to say that they won't work in the in, in the future. I've I've found, I don't know, at least over the last twenty years, it's it's hilarious how often something comes along that we all reject, and then about ten years later we all embrace it again, whether it's gifts or QR codes or podcasts. You know, these things come along and then and then they sort of fade and then they roar back in a huge way. So it's it's very possible that it could. I haven't seen the example of that yet, and and I side with Saul in saying that that I think. You know, there's so many different social platforms out there, and and even what's what's defined as a social platform today, because you know TikTok was a client of ours for a while, and they, they didn't, the people who worked there at the time anyway, didn't really look at it as a social network. They looked at it as a content studio, you know, that has social components, uh, which is a little bit closer to to YouTube, for instance. It's uh, it's content, but then there's social aspects, as opposed to Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, the way that those operate socially. So. I haven't seen that niche one, which doesn't mean it's not there, but there are so many big platforms to be on. You know, if you want to have a big conversation about some niche topic, it's on Reddit. It's already happening on Reddit somewhere, or it's happening on Quora or one of these other platforms. So I, I think those conditions haven't changed yet, which is the reason they didn't succeed 10 years ago. The, the conditions haven't changed to make a niche one better or more attractive. And, and it could because, you know, what's happened lately with the different privacy issues and uh, and the monetization of it and, and all those all the reasons we love to hate Facebook, um, those sorts of things. And by the way, I still love Facebook anyway. <laughs> I love to hate it, but I also love to love it. Uh, you, you know, there's there's it just is. And and so some people are going to be turned off by that. And, and maybe those things will drive people into 
a, a newer opportunity. And I think that's what some of the basing is. But in general, these big platforms tend to be kind of vision based. Somebody sees a way of collaborating and communicating in a way that people hadn't before. And, and you know, in the case of TikTok, it, it was kind of inspired by Vine, but somebody, but people saw the, the potential for an algorithm to suggest stuff and, to, and, and what could be done there. And, and they saw this vision and then people lot jumped onto that. I, I think the same was true, whether it was Facebook or, or Twitter or Instagram or any, any platform. Somebody sort of has a vision for something that is different. Or Snapchat is a great example. Here's something completely different. And when they give people this I don't know, new toolkit of ways to express themselves and connect with people, that's the thing that's amazing. And I'm positive we haven't reached the end of that. It's not like just because we can't imagine it now that somebody won't. I think it's more likely that we'll see other companies that we can't even imagine yet come up and rein reinvent what social could look like. I think that's more likely to happen than the niche subject matter oriented uh, social platforms. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I, I like I like the, the theory of a network like this because of the cleanness of it, because of the ethical quandaries going away as mm. a result of it. But I have to agree with you guys. You know, it it doesn't seem like it's a reasonable take on it. So, what what I'm questioning though is, I mean, I know that Andreessen Horowitz has a lot of vested interest in having this opinion. I mean, if they've got investments mm. in this space, they're trying to go forward and they're trying to say this is a good bet. These are great services. You should use them. That's what it's really about. Um, but they don't seem like they're a desperate company. You know, it doesn't seem like this is some desperate play. They really believe it. And if they really believe it, is there something there that we're not seeing, Saul? Is there something more to this story that could potentially change your mind? Is there some kind of new recipe that you can think of that would make it more palatable and more profitable? Uh, so, uh, you know, th th they're not desperate. And, and like I said, I, I read most of it and I thought it was really put together. I think that it's a really interesting, you know, how they brought, they, they broke them into sections. And, and again, I did say it was advertorial and it was self-serving because the job of a VC is to add value to their investments and to, you know, sort of get them out. But, you know, their thoughts on social selling and their thoughts on all these different categories I hadn't seen anybody break it down into those groups so succinctly um, yes. before. So, um, so that I thought they did a really good job. And if anything, I think, you know, well, I should say that they, they wrote something really amazing. I didn't think that they shared it as wide as they could have, because I think they could be getting a lot more traction on this. Cause you know, I, I sort of didn't even see the article until, uh, it was posted up as a conversation for today. So I, I would say they did half of an amazing job on it. The content was stellar. The distribution wasn't, they, see, they, did, they, distribu Max, they distributed it, should... they distributed it via their own social networks that they're investing in. That's why we never saw it. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, is it is it going to change the way I think of things? Um, you know, not like night and day, but there was certainly some. I, I took some notes, and there was a couple of things that I made a note to follow up on, maybe do a little bit more reading on. But you know, like I, I'm I'm deep in planning for 2021, and and this this these articles didn't make me uh, sort of like put the brakes on and and go in a different direction. So maybe that's me being short sighted, or or just uh, you know I wasn't the audience, or it wasn't the right time. It, you know what? It just when I had a when I stopped talking for a second, I thought of a contrary viewpoint to my own ramble earlier, uh, which is I, I thought I actually thought of a niche social media platform that I think is doing fairly fairly well, uh, which is Fishbowl. Um, and I mm -hmm. don't know whether you're you're familiar with it or yeah. not, but I'm on it a lot, and most of the advertising industry seems to be. And and that is one. I'm familiar with the advertising one, but I, but I believe there's different fishbowls for for different uh, you know industries and stuff like that. And their unique thing was making it anonymous. I think if it wasn't anonymous, it would basically just be copying LinkedIn. But but the fact that people can sort of post and complain and dish on on agencies and people within agencies and the politics and all this sort of stuff somewhat anonymously is what makes it. It, it's it's like a it's like a so, slack for ranting about the industry. It's kind of fun. Um, it's kind of interesting. So and, I, go ahead. So I, I kind of 
I, I kind of tired of fishbowl. And again, <laughs> this is all just personality driven or whatever preference. But man, like there's so much negativity that you could find anywhere on the internet. I just didn't need like, you know, it's like that that old expression, you don't need that that in your life. It just I didn't need another place to 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 see unhappy people talk about things that I already kind of know what's going on. But I, I do agree it, it's a great example of 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 a very niche thing that that's going on and and people have embraced it greatly. I will say it's gotten a bit more positive during during the pandemic, a bit, where it was certainly a year ago, I think it was it was the uh, the old agency spy blog <laughs> come to life on as a messaging platform. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's I see a lot of people that are out. They're really like supporting people. People will post problems and stuff that they're going through or issues they're going through, and I've seen a lot more support. And I don't. I wonder if that's. I haven't thought about it until ten seconds ago when I started this sentence, but. I wonder whether or not there's a reaction to, you know, the, the times we find ourselves in right now and whether or not that's changing how people are reaching out or, or, or how they feel about it. Even even still being anonymous, there seems to be less trolling or maybe I just maybe the algorithm doesn't serve me up trolling exercises. It only serves me up positive stuff. What, I find, what I find fascinating about all of this is that no matter how far down the path we go, we just keep recycling the same things. I mean, you know, Slack, the whole phenomenon around it and Fishbowl and all these services are basically BB, um, um, BBSs and bulletin board systems, which became <laughs> forums, yeah. you know, forums are the same thing. Only the only difference is this is an app on your phone, but it's still just a, a news forum. It's just uh, it's just a bulletin board system of kind. So well, it's back, interesting. Back when I logged on bulletin board systems, you you had to call and, and it was you'd get a busy signal until somebody finally hung up and then you could get through <laughs> and then post your thing. And then yeah. you had to hang up so somebody else could respond to you. Yeah, it was a different day. Those were the days. Well, I want to move on. I want to talk next about Apple. The rumor mill is in full gear right now about the thought that Apple is building its own search engine. So if, when you hear this, you immediately think Bing, you know, like why would Apple want to do something like this? But when you think for a minute longer and you really consider the opportunities here for Apple, considering their dominant position in the mobile space right now, is it not? Is it the craziest strategy? I mean, is it is it worth doing? Is it worth considering? Yeah. So I actually didn't think Bing when I when I um, heard this. The thing that popped into my head was, oh, well, that that makes perfect sense. They've got X number of billions of people using their their mobile devices. So why not just build a search engine and make it the, uh, you know, the the default uh, search engine on their device. But of course, we know they make a lot of money from Google just to have it on their phone. But when you, you know, the, the thoughts that came to my head was, there's no other company in the world except for Google that has as much data on us, um, you know, than, than Google, you know, they've got, they, they've got our financial information. If we're buying anything from iTunes, they know all of our preferences and they know where we go all day long based on our phones. If you've got an Apple device, as opposed to an Android device that pretty much could build personas around, you know, every one of us. So it makes perfect sense that they would be, they'd want to build a search tool and be able to offer better search and things that we would care about and stuff like that. Um, you know, one of the things that sort of caught my eye and Apple's on this real kick right now about privacy. And uh, they said that, you know, privacy would be uh, a major, um, you know, sort of brand promise as far as a uh, search. And I personally think that's a really interesting consumer promise, but from a marketing standpoint, you know, from everything I read, it certainly doesn't mean that you won't be able to track people from app to app. They're certainly going to make it a little bit more difficult, but the way Apple makes things more difficult is they make people opt out. And, you know, as we all know, as marketers, there's a lot of people who will never, they'll never know they need to opt out. They'll never understand how to opt out and they just won't do it because, you know, for the reasons I've already stated. So, you know, should they do this? Probably, absolutely. Are they lined up for success? Probably, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, is is the the promise of of uh, you know privacy a, a thing? I think it will be for for some brands, not others. And the other reason I don't see it being kind of like a Bing problem is you know Microsoft has 
all the brains in the world and and they they build something um, but they don't have the the religious you know fervor that that apple fanboys sort of uh, give apple they didn't have a, a device that had the same popularity um they're not collecting data on people the same way apple is and you know like they, they just don't have that that thing that Apple has that, you know, if you're in, you're in, and, and if you're, you're in, you're probably all in. So I think, you know, we're at the point now where Apple can't really fail on many things. Um, so, you know, it, it makes perfect sense for them. And, you know, the, sm the smart play is, is also that they aren't trying to compete with Google's approach. So, and maybe not even their business model because, you know, they're, they're, they're making this privacy focus. They're not just trying to sell ads. And I do think when Bing came out, it just felt like they were trying to be Google, but not Google. And, you know, in this case, I, I don't know. how It's all theoretical anyway. But, um, you know, it's rumor mill as opposed to something they've announced. But it, it seems like they would just embed it into their devices. So if I'm already using my phone or my iPad, this is just the search that I get. Uh, presumably, if I'm in a web browser and I've chosen to use something else, then they're not going to block that or anything. But because... It's all being merged together, you know, with Siri, and um, I had to say that carefully so she didn't start talking to me on my phone. Um, you know, so, but since it's all being merged together, this is, it's just going to be seamless. And so we probably won't even, it's not like we have to choose whether to use it. So I was saying, it's just there. Um, but then the other thing that I think is interesting, and I don't know whether they're going to do this, but they could, is as... Um, cookies goes away and on the browser it's harder to track people apple's going to own the they're going to know the devices and so they can they can be targeting by device as opposed to trying to target by user and uh we see this is know, where this is where again, this yeah. this is where the argument all falls apart for me because uh i mean i'm i'm not pollyanna i know that they're they're <laughs> pushed toward user privacy and better controls for users and opt in rather than opt out and all these other things that are pissing off most of the ad industry i mean all of that is just a power grab on apple's part i i, I see that <laughs> but i'm struggling to see what the money revenue benefit of having a, your own search engine is in today's day and age, especially when you're talking about Apple, who's so focused on not selling ads. I mean, at least giving the users the, the ability not to see ads on their on their system. So we have I, data, I, though, they might sell the data, even if they don't sell ads. And, uh, you know, they, they're, they won't do it for nothing. They're doing it because they see something in it, whether it's a, a loss leader that if they can get people to adopt, then they figure out how to turn but on the why, But why later. do it? I mean, it's just like Saul brought up the really big point that, you know, quite frankly, uh, had escaped me. Thank you for bringing it up, was the fact that Google is paying them lots and lots of money for every single search on their, on their mm -hmm. devices. I mean, you know, Google is the default search engine for the Apple devices. So why would you give up that revenue? What, how can they possibly replace that revenue yeah. owning their own search engine? I, I can In think fairness, of lots it, of ways. It's only like $6 billion. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's only $6 billion. I mean, good well, God. If they, if they own the data, that data is, is going to be tremendously valuable. It would be tremendously valuable to them. It would be valuable to, to other brands. So they, they could conceivably sell the data in... in you know how this balances with the privacy stuff. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm speaking very theoretically as opposed to specifically here. Um, but that that's one thing they could do. They could run their own ads, and they might not look like Google's type of search ads. Although that it's such search advertising is such a smart way to go because it delivers an ad for exactly what I'm looking for at that time. Yeah, so it's about copying intent. That model makes it, a lot of sense. Intent is a, one of the most powerful features. That's why. You yeah. know, that's why Amazon has the best search engine data for anybody buying stuff because it is, they're showing clo you're, they're closer to the intent of buying on their site than Google is. So that's why their right. da data is so valuable. So you're absolutely right. And, but, and then there's all the apps that, that sit on Apple's ecosystem, in Apple's ecosystem, right? So there's all these different apps on my phone. And it, if the, if the phone itself, if the if they've got device data and, and search data and everything like that, they can perhaps either be valuable to those apps or valuable to the ads within those apps or anything like that. Again, now Apple's not stupid. They've got a monetization plan. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I can think of lots and lots of ways that they could play with this. And if getting you to opt in or... <laughs> 
or not not have a problem with it if, if they can increase you know people's acceptance of this early on by playing the privacy card i could see them doing it i don't know I, i'm not pessimistic about it either i don't i don't think they're necessarily out to, I, I i i'm like you i'm not pollyanna but i believe they're they probably do have the right intent here because they are a, um, a customer-centric company. And if that's going to be important to people, then they're going to lean into that. But the world will find other ways. I, I, don't, I think the genie is out of the bottle when it comes to targeting. That's just going to – it's going to be around. I, I don't see a world where that tote goes away completely. But we, we've talked about this, you know, maybe a year ago. I'm, you know, I'm bad with timelines, but we talked about, you know, all of this – you know, privacy and could it lead to, you know, something similar to Facebook letting people build up their, their, um, you know, their pages and then, you know, start paying for them. Like, you know, Apple is not against charging for ads. There used to be the iAds and, you know, there are Apple ads, whatever they were called. And, you know, it's like they're, they're beholden to, to people and they need to, you know, they need to keep making a ton of dough and they don't have that many SKUs and they can't just keep relying on hardware to make a ton of money and stuff like that. So I, and that's you know, a good, that's a great maybe, point. Services has become a huge, a bigger and bigger portion of their revenue every single year. So if they were yeah, to okay. add search into that bundle of services that you're getting out of it, I mean, is it possible that they could use this as a premium product where they make money off of it as part of the bundle of services you get when you sign up for a, uh, an iCloud account. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yeah. you know, it's not that hard to believe that they won't start charging for ads, you know, if not on day one, on day 700 or something like they always seem to take the long, uh, the long approach to things, but you know, like they are, they're altruistic, but not to a fault. And, you know, they're, they're in the business of making money too. So, you know, like, um, you know, uh, maybe it's just my my pessimism shining through or something or pragmatism shining through. But, um, you know, like you don't launch a search engine unless you're going to charge for it eventually. Mm. Well, these are really great points. Well, I got to move on to the final topic because we're running out of time. Um, it seems to be a returning theme on this show. Um, Amazon has officially become the world's largest advertiser. Tim. I'll just ask this bluntly. Is this a good thing or a bad thing when we think about Amazon being the biggest advertiser in the world? Um, it wasn't so long ago that they were so anti-advertising that they didn't have any advertising on television or any branding whatsoever. They were just doing the, the digital stalk you ads until recently. <laughs> you know, So, I mean, this is a big shift for this company. Yeah, I, I've got no problem with it. I don't know if that makes it a good thing or, or, or not, but it's... I think a good way of looking at it is to compare it to you know, the brand they replaced, uh, who is now the number two, which is P&G. And P&G is, is, or had previously been the, the biggest advertiser because they've got so many different products and they've got so much going on. And they're trying to uh, build the brands of those because a lot of them are in fairly commoditized categories. So, Look at Amazon, and Amazon does a lot of stuff, and they do a lot of it very, very well. I think sometimes people don't even know that what they do, uh, and they need to advertise that. And a lot of it is arguably getting more commoditized when certainly a lot of their growth was was more almost at a D to C level where it was, we're just going to do an awesome job. And word of mouth is going to spread us around. And if we're insanely customer centric, that's that's going to do it. Uh, lots of people have copied that model. So it's the problem with that is once it's successful, you know, Target, Walmart and everybody has other versions of it. And, and that's just one aspect of where they compete is at the retail level. You know, Prime Video is another one. You know, they A lot of their money is going into Prime Video uh, or a lot of their advertising. I, I see anyway is for Prime Video which has to compete against Netflix and HBO Max and uh, all of that stuff. So they, they've just got so many different product lines out there. And I think it's important to, to build their brand. And I'll be honest, a lot of their stuff is really, really good. They do a good job maintaining an Amazon-ness to all of their advertising across all of their, all of their different products and services that they have out there. And you know, I, I don't even have a, a full list, but I, I just now thought of, oh, and then there's the Kindle and then there's the 
uh, the different Alexa machines and then the smart plugs. Amazon makes so much stuff that to compare them to a PNG, it actually makes sense. They've, they've just become I mean, Amazon, sort of you're massive right. advertiser. They have their own jeans. They have their own fashion labels. You know, they have their, <laughs> That's right. I mean, they sell batteries, they sell wires. Yeah. I mean, they sell everything under the Amazon, yeah. under the Amazon name. So there's a lot going on there. Um, not only do they sell everything, they um, they monitor what is uh, doing really well on Amazon, and then they um, they copy they it. white label it, <laughs> and they, they yeah. copy it. So um, you know they're they're very similar to a P and G because they pretty much make everything. Yeah, every time that yeah, subject exactly. comes up, we talk about uh, Wendy Cooper. She complains about this all the time. And it finally hit her on that as well. Her her bathroom stool just got copied. So. Oh, geez. <laughs> we'll see what's going to go on with that. Hey, let me ask one more question on this theme. I mean, d- does this set Amazon apart in the big tech malaise that's going on right now? I mean, it, it, it's not just that they're selling lots of ads because they are a big provider of ads to other brands, but they're also seeding ad revenue to other media properties. So does this make them a better corporate citizen as a result, is this something that gives them a pass for some of the scary behavior that Congress is looking to regulate and people are starting to rise up against? I mean, is is this advantageous to them in any way, being in this position? I don't think it gives them a pass. It obviously makes them incredibly bright and opportunistic, but like they, they do some questionable things like all the other tech companies. So they're not alone, um, but they certainly, you know, doesn't give them a pass. Yeah, there's opinion. always been a, a frenemies aspect to, um, you know, to all the big tech that, that you're, you're referencing there, Bob, in, in terms of they are bo- both a competitor, you know, and a disruptor to the advertising industry, to the big media players, to other, uh, (laughs) all the people they're copying, all that stuff. And yet then they're also the primary channel for selling those. And now they're spending money on those channels. And so, I don't know, it's, it's kind of the circle of life. It's, I don't, I agree with Saul. It doesn't like absolve them of their sins or anything like that in anybody's eyes, but it becomes this mutual, there's a mutual dependence that is just, we, you can't escape. Like I, I can't imagine that any of the networks or publications that Amazon is a big spender on can't imagine any of them would want them to go away from that point of view. And at the same time, then they're a competitor for eyeballs with prime video and you know, any number of other places. And for advertising revenue, you know, it's when at first, you know, when you first share this topic, I actually, I misinterpreted it at first. I thought you were saying that it was the place where people spend the most on advertising uh, because they've got to be close to that as well, um, as well as being the biggest spender. Well, they're a distant third. They're a distant third. They're they're up there, but they're not nearly as big as Facebook and, and Google are. But, yeah, it's true. Third they're isn't getting, bad. <laughs> third is not bad when you're playing in this yeah. rarefied air. Well, with that, it's time for this week's Fair, Fail, Foul. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug, starting with Mr. Saul Colt. You can find him at autozen.com. Tell us what's going on in your world, Saul. What would you like to promote? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to the year ending. Um, so, uh, uh, <laughs> you and everybody else, <laughs> not, not that, that, you know, not that the, the first few months of next year are going to be any different, but, um, you know, it's just always nice to sort of bookmark the end of the year and, and, uh, move forward and look, uh, look with optimism. So I, I got nothing to, to really, um, uh, plug or promote, you know, follow me on the internet, Saul Cold, all one word, pretty much everywhere. If you want to buy me a, um, you know, a holiday gift, feel free. I'm open to it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, thank you for having me on the show. I, I will always appreciate being here. Everybody should mention that they have an Amazon dream list. <laughs> 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 now, next up, we have Tim Leak. You can find him at rpa.com. That's the home of the agency where he is the chief marketing and innovation officer. Tell us what's going on in your world, uh, Tim. What would you uh, like to promote? Oh, there's so much going on. But, you know, the, the I, I've been wanting to do a, an, an email list for some time. So that's what I'm going to shamelessly promote is my own email list, um, which would be found at timleek.com, which is T-I-M-L-E-A-K-E.com. And um, here's the thing is I actually have a love-hate 
relationship with with email lists. I, I love I love them. I sign up for them all the time, and then they get in my inbox, and and I hardly ever read them because they're too long, and I don't have time because it's in my inbox, and I've got other stuff to do. So I've committed to doing this as as a weekly email across a couple different topics that I've put up there, and they're going to be short, and that's the thing. I've uh, I, I'm I'm going to do short little uh, weekly emails that I hope take no longer than thirty seconds to read because. Speaking from my own point of view, that's how much that that's my <laughs> window of patience with an email. So uh, I've got a bunch of them queued up. I'm really excited about it. Uh, there's a lot of work that I'm still doing on my website, so be patient with it. But you can, in fact, sign up for the email list there, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping all the Beancast listeners will flood on over and give me some good feedback. That sounds great. That sounds awesome, and congratulations for getting back into that. As for Thanks. me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. You can also find my Amazon gift list. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. I should put one of those together. <laughs> yeah, you have a grand opportunity to talk about it. Um, anyway, uh, if you want to advertise on the show or find out more information about the show, just check it all out at thebeancast.com. And now it's time for this week's Fair, Fail, Foul, a rundown of the best and worst of advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. First up, Saul, this is right up your alley. I'm not sure how you feel about this one, but KFC ignited the internet with its Colonel Sanders mini-movie. Um, I, I think every part of this was just so brilliantly executed, right down from you know making it... Uh, all the the posters, you know, the casting of it, you know, the fact that it's on Lifetime of all places. I mean, it's just such a well thought out word of mouth campaign. Even if the movie sucked, it doesn't matter. The damage is done. Everybody knows about it. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I'm. It's funny. I'm not a big fan of of the food of KFC, but they're they're in the, like the Saul Cold Hall of Fame of. Uh, great word of mouth stuff all the things they do the the um you know the 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 logs the, they got fire logs that smell like kfc my, my two uh things that really stood out for me with the movie was one i i kind of felt a little cheated i haven't seen it yet but i will watch it i kind of felt a little cheated that it's only 15 minutes i think you know at least put in a good 22 for make it an episode of a you know, the, the length of a sitcom. Um, but one thing I thought that was really, really good, you know, mentioning the log and everything, I liked the um, the uh, KFC scented lube tie-in that uh, they're promoting with the, the show as well. <laughs> Can I say, I, th I think this is my favorite thing that any brand has done all year. That's how much I love it, too. It's so it's great. Just, so, you know, you see the thing that you know is going to take home all the canned lions next year, and you see it and you go, oh, yep, that was it. And... Um, I'm right there with you, Bob. It was, it's just, it was spot on. I, I love that they actually, they didn't just try to make it look like a lifetime movie. They just worked with them and they made a lifetime movie. Like, <laughs> like I know it, 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 it was only 15 minutes, but it was, it was with the lifetime group that put it together. Um, which I just think is genius and casting Mario Lopez in it. was Genius. It's just so right. Yeah. So much about this is wonderful. And, and when, um, when people um, tweet tomorrow about how great this episode was, I want at least one person to recognize my scented lube joke. That's that's brilliant. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get any reaction from either one of you, but please go on. I was on, I was on mute, but I was laughing. Mm. We, we, we heard you. People are laughing themselves <laughs> silly right now. <laughs> now, as a as a runner up on that, I do want to pay a quick mention to Alberta, um, Canada, uh, Edmonton, Alberta did a public service announcement around holiday COVID spread that I thought was brilliant. Uh, I'll let you guys out there in the audience check it out for yourselves. It's it's really quite good and quite effective and reminds me of an SNL sketch that came out this week, which probably copied this when you think about it, but um, really good. Well, the fail for this week goes to Pretty Little Thing, a website, because um, they sparked horror for advertising earbuds that were obviously covered with earwax, Tim. Did you see this picture? <laughs> I did. And I saw it going around on social. And, and, and it's like, I, you just, it's like, why? Like, who, who would do like a catalog shoot and use a used pair of earphones? And then I start to go down a hole of wondering, do, do we think maybe they did it on purpose to get people talking about it more? Even though, you know, in the interest of all, all publicity is good publicity, 
I, I doubt it. I may, Maybe it just had to do with the fact that we are in COVID times and they couldn't get the thing. And there's like the person taking the photo was the person building the website. I don't know. I, I have no idea how that happened. And it's it's kind of ridiculous. But mm-hmm. why wouldn't you just buy a new pair of headphones? Yeah, it, it seems so ludicrous why this happened, but it was pretty disgusting. Well, the foul. I'm just glad it's 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 a reminder that beautiful people are gross too. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well, the foul for this week, I'm going to give to RC Cola Philippines, Saul, because they created one truly disturbing ad. I mean, this kid comes home, says that he's adopted, and suddenly he starts screaming, "Why do I have these glasses coming out of my?" back and suddenly the mother's taking her head off and she's a giant bottle of RC Cola and she's pouring in there and then the whole family's drinking out of this guy kid's back. I mean, this is going to be the weirdest, most disturbing thing I've seen in advertising <laughs> for a long time. What are your thoughts? See, um, Bob, one person's foul is another person's fair. <laughs> That's I, um, why I got the I foul embraced... and not the fail. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I am I embraced um, this ad because it reminded me a lot of my bar mitzvah video. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't remind me of anything personal, but I got to say I, I actually liked the spot too. So um, it was that it's that weird spot. It's the one you always wish you could get somebody to buy that sort of thing, and and, and you know it it was truly 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 weird, but. Um, <laughs> It worked for me. And the fact that it went viral and took off is is probably it's probably done okay for them. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, got a comment, have a question, we'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail dot com. And that does it for this week's edition of this podcast. <laughs> Visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, we've also provided a direct link to our listing there, or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory on the Apple Podcasts app. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then. It's just like, um, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, like if it's, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know, man. It's just like, okay, it's like, um, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, totally like.